It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Still keeping with our 4th of July special, we're talking about the client nation to God of which we are one. I don't think the message will go for an hour today because I ate some bad chicken. I don't, even, I don't even like to think about chicken anymore after eating that. And that was a couple of days ago, but it just, it's nasty. So a client nation is this. A client nation is a national entity under the patronage of God. And that's us, United States of America. And Israel started out as the client nation. And they started out as being assigned the responsibility for the formation, preservation, communication, and fulfillment of the canon of Scripture. Before Israel became a nation, custodianship of the Word of God involved divine revelation apart from Scripture. But since Israel did become a client nation, Israel was involved in the authorship, custodianship, and dissemination of the Word of God. Remember, Moses wrote pretty much the whole Torah. And uh, Moses, of course, uh, pulled Israel out of Egypt. So additional custodianship was assigned to Israel in the formation of the New Testament. Since all of the writers except two, all the writers of the New Testament except two of them are Jews. The other two are Gentile, everyone else Jews. So they did have a custodianship of the Word of God. They even had a custodianship of the Word of God when Israel was going under the fourth and eventual fifth cycle of discipline in August of 70 AD. So during the time of the formation of the New Testament, the client nation changed from Judea to the Roman Empire. That occurred in August of 70 AD. In August of 70 AD, the Romans overran Jerusalem, and that was the end of Israel. There is an Israel today, but it is not a client nation. It's a religious nation, but it's not a client nation. In the future, it will be a client nation in the millennium. And uh, whether this Israel lasts or not, I don't know. It may last, it may go under. We just don't know, but uh, I imagine it's, this will be the same Israel in the millennium. It, not the same, though, because there will be believers moving into Israel. So you really can't go off of today's history in terms of what's happening in Israel because our dispensation is totally separated from the tribulation. And I know my mom's been listening, I've listened with her to this uh, thing by Tim LaHaye and the dispensational things, they're, they're accurate. The dispensations are accurate and uh, some of the things he says are a bit goofy but uh, the dispensations are pretty accurate and it's quite entertaining anyway. Uh, I don't know even why I brought that up except just to say that uh, today's Israel, it does not mean that this will be the same Israel in the tribulation. So in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, we have a reference to the client nation concept. Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. We might as well look at it in order to understand what a client nation is all about. We are a client nation. And all of us here reap the benefits of being part of a client nation. Have you ever thought about if you, uh, you know, we're like one twentieth of the population. And if you looked at statistics, you were uh, a fifth more likely to be born Chinese. You see, yet you're born in the United States. You're born under privilege. I wonder if everybody, anybody thinks about that. I thought about that today. Here I am, born in the United States of America in a place of privilege and prosperity and freedom. Just thank God for it. 
Exodus 19, 4 through 6, we have the um, a reference to the quiet nation concept. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if hearing, you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. Then you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to me. And so is the United States. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. That's to remind them of the fact that they are a client nation. And oftentimes people forget about the freedom and the how people have died for your freedom. And this is a time when we need to recognize as being this uh, 4th of July weekend that we have something special. Deuteronomy 7.6 also talks about client nation Israel. Client nation Yisrael. Deuteronomy 7.6 For you are a holy people. Holy means to be set apart. For you are a holy set apart people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. That was for Israel in Deuteronomy 7, 6. It applies to us. Most believers today reside in the United States of America. Of course there are believers outside of these borders, but most believers reside within these borders. That makes us a Gentile client nation. Some pastors preach the only client nation was Israel. There's no other, and that's incorrect. That's why in the Bible this is called the times of the Gentiles. Why is it called the times of the Gentiles? Because Gentiles will make up client nations. That's why. That's the only reason why. And the people who say that are going against what uh, Colonel Thiem has said, and they're so arrogant they think they know more. That's a big problem today among people who have even been ordained from Baraka Church. They have gone away from what has been taught in the uh, theological system set up, and they're way out of line. They're not even close to being right. It's pretty sad to me. And this is part of the reason why we're in a uh, downtrend in this country. Deuteronomy 26, 18 through 19. This also deals with Israel as a client nation to God. Deuteronomy 26, 18. Deuteronomy 26, 18 through 19. Now we're dealing with Israelites here, Jews. And the Lord has today declared you to be His people a people for his own possession. The actual Hebrew word here means his own treasured possession. For his own treasured possession, as he promised you, therefore you are to keep all his commandments, and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made, for praise, fame, and honor and that you shall be a holy people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. Now again, some of the benefits of being a client nation are these. Praise, fame, and honor. Do you know what the uh, second... The, uh, there's one word that people recognize all over the earth, and that's okay. Everybody recognizes okay. The second most recognized word that I saw on the History Channel today, the second most recognized word in the world is Coca-Cola <laughs> out of Atlanta, Georgia. That's praise. That's fame. And you know all the people of the world listen to our music. They watch our movies. If you go to Germany, you'll hear American music. <laughs> The other day I watched the Japanese Prime Minister. He came over and you know what the Japanese Prime Minister dream was? 
to see Graceland. He said, I love Elvis. And you know, he did. Elvis is his idol. That's what he thought. And uh, so George W. Bush said, well, let's go to Graceland. So George W. Bush took the Prime Minister of Japan to Graceland and he put on a pair of Elvis uh, glasses. It was hilarious. If you got to see it on Fox News, you'll just laugh. I'll play it on the internet for you who didn't see it. But he puts on these glasses of Elvis Presley and then he starts air guitaring it. <laughs> he tries to sing with his Japanese accent, singing Elvis. It was, it was phenomenal. It was funny. And George Bush just standing aside laughing at him. <laughs> what is this guy? <laughs> but he loved Elvis Presley. And you know what he said? He said, my dreams have come true. And then he started saying, he started to sing, dream, the impossible dream. And then he said, this is my dream to see Elvis. And then I thought, a little too much sake there, boy. <laughs> I think so. Well, I'll show it to those of you who haven't seen it. That is at home. So th this is what happens. We have influence all throughout the world. We have praise. We have fame and honor. And something else that the only thing people in a, another country will think about, Elvis Presley, that's my dream. I want to see where Elvis lived. I want to see his jet plane and everything else. That's part of being a client nation and all the frills that we have is part of that. And we are so blessed, so very blessed. Uh, we ca I can't even begin to tell you how much uh, richer we are than all the other people in the world. If you've ever been to Mexico, you'll get an idea of it as soon as you cross the border. It's one of the weirdest things ever to cross the border and see a bunch of dirty little young people with their hands out asking for change. It's sad, really, to see it all. And I know why they run over the border. Well, this is the land of opportunity. Again, we are a land of law, though, and we shouldn't let everybody come in unless they follow the system that we have set up, of course. But if you've ever been to Mexico, you'll begin to realize why they do it. They have no hope, no hope whatsoever in the country that they live in. And so they want to come here. Well, that's natural. On this 4th of July, we are a nation of immigrants, and it's natural for people to want to come here and share in our prosperity. The only thing is, they need to acclimate to our culture. They need to learn English. That will show some respect for us. Learn our language and uh, do it legally. So 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5 tells us how we are a priest uh, nation, as it were. Now the name priest nation is used for Israel because it has a specialized priesthood. The term client nation is used only for the Gentile client nation that performs the same functions during the church age. And that's what, where we come up with the word client nation. Israel, again the difference. Israel, priest nation. USA, client nation. Roman Empire, client nation. Sweden at one point, client nation, Germany, Prussia, France, England, client nations at one point many, many, many years ago. Not today, of course. So that's the difference. Priest nation given to Israel, client nation given to the church. Now 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5 says this. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. And coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by men, but elect and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house as a result of a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. What's a spiritual sacrifice? When you name your sins to God, you're giving a spiritual sacrifice. You see, it's just going back to the Old Testament and saying, what did they do in the Old Testament? Well, they would have a sacrifice of a lamb or something else and say, well, this is the rebound technique and that's how they taught it. But they did rebound the same way. They would name their sins to God. And, but they would teach it through the sacrifice of an animal. So the reason why it says this in the New Testament, offer up a spiritual sacrifice, rebound! 
rebound and keep moving. Offer up spiritual sacrifice. Name your sin to God. Every time you name your sin to God, you are, as it were, offering up a spiritual sacrifice. Acceptable to God through the agency of Jesus Christ. Again, Israel was always a holy nation, as described in the Bible. But the church is called a holy priesthood. Israel, holy nation. Church, holy priesthood. And that's because in the church age, every one of us is a priest. And we are a holy priesthood no matter where we live on the planet. But there still are client nations, and we are one of them. Now, Jesus Christ tested and proved the prototype spiritual life, as we've studied. And we offer up a spiritual sacrifice by the fulfillment of this spiritual life. By the fulfillment of the four spiritual mechanics. So God does not want sacrifice and offerings, as he said. He wants the sacrifice of the spiritual life. And there is sacrifice involved with it, very little. But the spiritual life sacrifices are acceptable to God. And what are those spiritual life sacrifices? The four spiritual mechanics. And it is a sacrifice. I appreciate you take time out on a Monday, July 3rd, to make your spiritual sacrifice. That's quite phenomenal, as tough as I am on you. I guess you've passed the test. You were able to be humble enough. Thank God for it. 1 Peter 2.9 Now let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are an elect race. But you are an elect race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for God's own possession. That's describing all of us as believers. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out from the darkness into his marvelous light. The idea of an elect race comes from the Greek phrase in 2 Corinthians 5.17, which we noted yesterday, kine kathesis. I won't bother writing it on the board. You probably have that in your notes from yesterday. Kine Ketesis, K A I N E K S or K T S I S. That means a new spiritual species. Now, the most important client nation and the key to all client nations is found in the client nation of Israel. That's where it all got started. And Israel started as a priest nation. Now, we as a client nation have certain responsibilities. In fact, we have to do five things. God directs and controls historical activity on the basis of a client nation and we as a client nation have to do five things. And these are the five things that a client nation must fulfill. We do many of these. We've uh, slacked off on some of them. I sure do hope we have a lot more time as a client nation in order that maybe at some point there will be a revival. There's no way we can know that, but I do hope so. We all hope that, or we should. So these are the five things. Number one, what must a client nation do to remain as a client nation? Number one, it must evangelize its own population at home. It must evangelize its own population at home. We've really kind of slipped away from that. Evangelists don't even know what they're saying anymore. Billy Graham's son even tries to uh, give the gospel and it's even worse than his father. But there must be evangelization. And and because I say that, I'm not going to be judged because I can do like the Apostle Paul and warn you like Apostle Paul said, watch out for Didymus, watch out for so-and-so. Well, watch out for people who say invite Christ into your heart because it's not true. Why follow somebody who's not teaching truth? So... You must evang- a client nation must evangelize its own population. We've slipped away from that, and that means we're in danger. Number two, it must communicate Bible doctrine, the Word of God, to the believers in the nation. We've slipped away from that, way away. Those two things on the surface will make everything else fall apart. Number three, no, number one again, You must evangelize your own population. Number two, you must communicate the word of God to the believers in that nation as pastor teachers. Number three, a client nation is is responsible for the custodianship of Bible doctrine. 
And even though we failed in many ways, this nation is still the custodian of Bible doctrine. There's no one in Africa who has the custodianship of the Word of God. Nobody in Africa would know it. They have to get it from us. Nobody in India, they have to get it from us. Nobody in China, they have to get it from us. Nobody in Russia, definitely nobody in Europe. Nobody around the world is the custodian of the Word of God except right here in the United States, namely Houston, Texas, in which the Word of God has been spread out all over. And I happen to be the custodian of Colonel Thames Notes. Oh well, that's the way it works. And so it's still within this nation. So we have succeeded in that area. Number four, we've succeeded in this area. It provides a haven for the Jews. We do that. And I do not really see a rise in anti-Semitism here. Among certain races in this country, that might be true, but for the most part, there has not been a rise in anti-Semitism that I know in this country. In Europe, they are extraordinarily anti-Semitic. You go to Europe and you go to a graveyard where there's a Jewish grave there with the Star of David, they graffiti it. They're just as bad as they were under Hitler. <coughs> So we provide a haven for the Jews. Number five, it is responsible, the client nation is responsible to send out missionaries to evangelize other nations. The client nation is responsible to send out missionaries to evangelize other nations. We have a few good evangelists who do that in this country, but not nearly enough. You know why we have so much immigration into this country? People get irritated at it. But you know why so many people come from India and Asia and all around the world? A lot of them are coming for the gospel. I have a friend from China came over. Only reason he came over here, while he was seeking prosperity, of course, he also was saved and goes to church now. Evangelism. And what we, we should be going to China. We should be going to Africa. We should be going to Asia and all of these places. But because we don't, God sends them here. He says, well, you're going to get the gospel. You'll just have to go over there to get it. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we have such an influx of uh, people coming into this country is because we failed on the missionary front. And we failed in many ways, and so did Israel, by the way. Israel never succeeded in missionary work. Israel was one of the worst client nations, or as it were, a priest nation. It was one of the worst in missionary activity. They were so snobby about their race, they had a hard time ever getting out and evangelizing and doing missionary work. All you have to look at, look at uh, Jonah. Jonah in the well, that describes Israel for you, pretty much. Now, of course, you have some great missionaries that come out of Israel. I can't really think of one offhand. But uh, people like Jonah, he was the missionary out of Israel, and he is the, uh, he's the symbol of it. He didn't want to go overseas and teach to the enemy. God made him do it, though. He got swallowed by a fish, not a whale. He got followed, swallowed by a fish, and the fish got sick at his stomach and vomited him out at the place where he should evangelize and do his missionary work. God has a sense of humor. Now there were five Jewish client nations in the Old Testament. There were five of them. Of course it was all Israel, but Israel would rise, Israel would fall. Israel would rise, Israel would fall. And these are the uh, different kingdoms. First of all, the theocratic kingdom from B.C. 1441 to 1020. The theocratic kingdom. The theocratic kingdom goes from Exodus, the time of Moses, to the prophet Samuel. The theocratic kingdom. What's that mean? It means there was not a live king for them. There was not a king who was alive on the earth for them. Jesus Christ was in heaven and he was the king. And he wasn't on earth. And he ruled from heaven. Jesus, a theocratic kingdom means that Jesus Christ was the king except he wasn't present on the earth. And again I say to you there was no live king. He was not alive. There was no one alive to uh, demonstrate to the people what they needed to do. It was Jesus Christ in heaven who is of course alive along with the word of God. 1441 to 1020 is when this occurred. 
And then the theocratic kingdom ended when the Jews went negative. And what they say? We want a king like other nations. What did they want? They wanted a live king. They wanted one that was alive. They didn't want one up in heaven somewhere. They wanted to see someone face to face. <laughs> one day I'm going to teach on face to face. There's nothing... Of course God has ordained face to face. And God has also ordained non-face to face for those people who will never have a chance to be face to face. And I'll, I we'll bring out scripture on this because people are going insane over this. And uh, it won't be in this message. Uh, maybe after the fourth, when we get back to humility, we will start uh, learning about that. Because I'll tell you what, living in South Carolina as a young man, there was no face-to-face -face pastor I could go to. And you say, well, you should have moved to Houston. I was a young man. I can't move to Houston. I'm going to school, etc. What do you think I'm going to do? Hop up and go to Baraka Church? No. So God provided. What did He provide? A non-face-to-face -face means called tapes. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. And you say, but I like face-to-face. -face. Well, of course you do. It's, it's, uh, I would have to say that face-to-face, uh, -face, for me, I would enjoy it. But some people just can't make it. Some people can't do it. Some people have uh, second shift jobs, never able to make it. Some people, uh, they, just, uh, they just can't make it. Some people are too ill to make it. Some people have health problems and they got to lay in a bed and listen on tape. Do you think they're lesser because of that? No. And you say, but I like it. Of course you do. You should. Well, if Colonel Thame were in my backyard, I'd love it myself. Man, who wouldn't? So, of course, there's a place for face-to-face, -face, and the Bible says that. There's a place for face-to-face -face teaching, and I'm glad uh, people could show up face-to-face. -face. There's also a place for non-face-to-face -face teaching when you just don't have the means. Or maybe, for example, I'm not everybody's right pastor. You might like somebody else. Well, that's fine. Go with somebody else, and, and you're better off doing that. If, if you, you see what it has to do with is who do you respect? Whose authority do you respect? Now, if you don't like the Word of God, you're not going to respect anybody's authority. But if you respond to the Word of God, who do you respect? And you may have listened to Colonel Thame, never really gained a respect for him, don't know how, but he was my right pastor. You see, we all have different right pastors. You might have listened to Rick Knapp, gained some respect for him, and say, well, that's who I'll listen to. I'll talk about that later. But uh, what we need to understand is if you respect the teacher and you're listening to the Word, well, thank God you're able to be face-to-face. -face. You're privileged. But it doesn't make you better. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't make you better to be face-to-face. -face. It just means you're privileged and enjoy it. And most people think they get face-to-face -face and they say, well, you got to be face-to-face -face and... They build an ego about it, but that's not the way to go about it whatsoever. And don't ever look down your nose at somebody who has to be on tapes and can't get it any other way. Don't do that. But people do it today. They really do. I got off on a tangent because it's been on my mind because I've heard some certain things lately and I just can't believe what certain people are teaching today. I cannot believe it. I can't. They definitely didn't get it from my pastor because my pastor taught if you can be face to face, be face to face, but uh, not everybody can be. And we even have in the Bible, I mean, <laughs> if we didn't listen to dead people, we wouldn't even have the Bible here. I mean, if you, the Apostle Paul wrote the greatest doctrines ever, and we still go off the Apostle Paul's writing, and he's been dead and gone for over 2,000 years. It's insane what people are coming up with, but I know why they're doing it. I know why people out of Baraka Church have been going in for the thing of saying you need to be face to face because they want to see more faces. It's an ego trip for them. And it's sad to see it. Whether you see a lot of faces or not is not the issue. If you teach the Word of God, you've got to understand, pastors, God provides the hearers. And if He doesn't, go do something else. What's the big deal? I know what the big deal is. They've got it made. They're not studying hard enough. And they don't want to go work eight hours a day at some place. That's what it is. So again, five Jewish client nations. First, the theocratic kingdom. 
And then they fell when they said, I want to be like other nations and I've got to have a king, a live king, one I can look at. Same thing's occurring today. And people are going away from Colonel Theme in droves because they think they need to be live somewhere. It's sad. And it's going to show up in our country. They're no different than these people who want a real king, a live king. Look, if the king's in Washington and you can't be near Washington, who cares? He's still your king. Jesus Christ, of course, is the king of Israel. Now the United Kingdom from Saul to Rehoboam is next. And the United Kingdom is, of course, under kings. And God said, all right, that's your volition. I'll give you some kings. First king he gave him was King Saul, and he was a jerk. And King Saul taxed them out the wazoo, and they probably wished after a while, I wish I didn't have this king. But, of course, immediately after Saul came David... And from this time, 1020 to 926, this was the greatest time in Israel's history. Not because they had a live king, but because during David's reign, that was a time of positive volition, and many people in Israel were positive toward the word. Both men and women, many people in Israel positive toward the word. Just look at Abigail, who David met along the road, and she bowed out to him. She was a woman of doctrine. Where did she get it? Samuel. Samuel was the great prophet and he was teaching a lot of doctrine to a lot of positive people. As a result, we have the greatest time in Jewish history from 1020 B.C. to 926 B.C. Then after that, we get to Rehoboam and he split the kingdom. That's Solomon's son and he was a real jerk. So the north, And then what we have now is a split in the kingdom and we have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. It would be today as if uh, the south won the civil war and we have a north and a south. Well, they had a north Israel and a south Israel and this is the way it ended up. And the northern kingdom was the first to fall. Sounds familiar today too. The northern kingdom was the first to go away from doctrine. By the way, the north was the foundation of the pivot. Then it moved south. Do you know in the south, there was a lot of voodooism. I even watched a movie on it. But in the south, there was a lot of voodoo. They came over from Africa, and a lot of the uh, white folks went along with it. Where do you get all of these uh, superstitions in the south? Like, uh, do not walk under a ladder. Do not uh, do this, that, and the other. Or if an owl is sitting outside your house in a tree and hoots that means uh, somebody's going to die in your family death that's all voodoo it all comes out of Africa and there are racists who grabbed onto that <laughs> that's that's funny in itself but they grabbed onto this African thinking and that's all part of what happened in the south and why was the south punished so severely during the civil war no pivot all the pivot was in the northeast was not in the south. In the south there was voodoo and uh, racism and uh, that's about it. But then, now where's the pivot in the south? You go up north, it's all Catholic now. Not then, it was all Protestant. So the northern kingdom goes from Jeroboam to Ho Ho Hosea or Hosea and that's from B.C. 926 to 721. That's the northern kingdom. They fell first under the fifth cycle of discipline. And of course there are 12, 12 tribes. Some of the tribes, tribes lived in the north. Some of the tribes lived in the south. But some of the people who had doctrine in the north moved south and said, forget this, they're apostate, they're about to go under. And they did. The northern kingdom went under first. Then we have the southern kingdom. And of course the northern kingdom again lasted from 926 to 721 B.C. Then we have the southern kingdom. That goes from... Rehoboam to Zedekiah and they lasted quite a lot longer Rehoboam to Zedekiah they lasted longer because they had a pivot and that was from 926 B.C. to 586 B.C. at that point the fifth cycle of discipline was administered by the Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar one day we'll study Nebuchadnezzar he's quite an interesting fellow he actually became a believer but before he became a believer, he went psychotic because of his arrogance and started eating grass like a cow. 
926 to 586, the southern kingdom. Now after these were destroyed, there was no client nation operational as such. During this period, after 586, there was no client nation. The Jews were held in exile. But then uh, Judah was freed, and in 516, of course there were 70 years so they could chew on it. Remember, they had to follow the... Uh, the uh, they had missed their uh, sabbatical years. And they had missed enough to where God said, all right, you've missed your sabbatical years like I told you you should follow. You've missed 70 of them. So you're going to spend 70 years in exile. And that's exactly how it came out. From 586 to 516, they celebrated their sabbaticals all at one shot. God has a sense of humor. But through that came Daniel and all sorts of people who had a lot of doctrine. So then in 516, we have Judah. And Judah lasted from 516 B.C. until... 70 A.D. August of 70 A.D. And that's the end of Jewish client nations until the millennium. And then Israel will exist in the millennium and then it will exist in the new heavens and new earth after the millennium. And those of you who are winners get to live in Jerusalem. Those of you who are not, do not. We will study that in Revelation at some point some point much later people will like to get their ears tickled on that stuff we'll study it when you're ready for it not to be insulting I'm just telling I know people get interested in that why do you think Tim LaHaye's book goes off the shelf so fast well it tickles people's ears it's entertaining it's a story it's a true story but it's still a story and that's what people like well we'll get to it and you'll get a lot more out of it than from Tim LaHaye I guarantee you Although it is pretty accurate in terms of its dispensations, you'll still get a lot more out of it. You say, but he's Dr. Tim LaHaye. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Was Jesus Christ a doctor? No. It matters a positive volition is all it counts in terms of being accurate. By the way, you don't sell Bible material. You don't sell it. You give it out for free. And I'm sure people have been saved reading those things, but um, and that was God's plan in eternity past, but still, surely they have their reward already. Money. Oh, they're wallowing in money right now. But they don't know anything about the spiritual life. They know about the tribulation. That's something very simple to understand. The tribulation, all of that stuff, it's going to happen. It's very easy to understand it. But why didn't they focus on their spiritual life right now, which is far greater than what this entertainment's all about? It is entertaining. I even watched the show. I watched the movie they made. It's entertaining and it's pretty accurate. But you don't sell the Word of God. And it's not a minor point. It's a serious point. The Apostle Paul never once sold the Word of God. And he was the best teacher ever. It is a serious point. It's irritating to see that... Uh, they just don't know enough. It's sad. So this is what has occurred. The uh, client nation of Israel finally ended in August of 70 AD. And then after that, Rome took over. And it was the Roman Empire. Now what destroys the client nation? Negative volition toward the Word of God. Not sin. Every nation is full of sinners. We're all sinners a degenerate form of sin called homosexuality rampant can destroy nation but that only occurs because of a huge part of negative volition negative volition to the word of God and that will destroy a client nation and there were periods of apostasy in Israel in the Old Testament and apostasy in a nation is a cancer it's a cancer and uh, we are at a time right now when we're almost at the fifth stage of cancer and no doctor is going to be able to heal us. We're getting to that point. You see, if you catch cancer early, you can live. They can chemo you, burn it out. It's painful, but it happens. We're getting to a point in this country where there's no chemo is going to be available. 
we've gone too far. We're in the fifth stage. We're just going to pass on. We're going to become part of a history book. And that's all that's going to happen to us. And I love my country, and I don't want to see that happen. But we've gone into such apostasy, it, I almost don't see a possibility for recovery. But of course, only God sees that. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. But in terms of just looking at, at it from the point, the standpoint of Bible doctrine, from the standpoint of history, we seem pretty doomed. Because what happens? In apostasy, it draws everybody that way. Now, if you're a young person, if you're young people, and you actually take an interest in the things that I say, and you take an interest in the Word of God, you're something special because there's a lot of apostasy in those schools ready to drag you away. There is a lot of it. There's a lot of... Uh, I, the music you listen to, your parents would have been beaten. Not you, I'm talking in general. The, the music that young people listen to, your parents would have been beaten black and blue for listening to it. Because it's all about sex. It's all a big beat. Of course, the beat, you know, it sounds good. Beat, boom, 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 boom. Put it in your car so it'll rattle and all the women will look over. Oh, he's got a nice system in there. Boom, 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 boom. But behind that boom, 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 boom is a lot of uh, sexual innuendo. A lot of stuff about sex outside of marriage. Things that, you know what they used to do? Elvis would shake his hips and uh, all the legalistic women would have heart attacks. Oh, I can't believe that. Elvis came to Spartanburg one time. He didn't like that place. It was full of legalists. They said, we don't like Elvis here. He shakes his hips too much. We went from shaking hips to the worst type of bile that can come out of somebody's mouth. Talks about beating women. It all degrades women, by the way, ladies. You shouldn't like it because it degrades you in every way. And the lady should be held in esteem. She shouldn't be beaten. It shouldn't. There shouldn't be songs out there talking about how women are beaten. There shouldn't be songs out there about how policemen should be shot. There shouldn't be songs out there... Songs, I say that with a grin. It's not a song, it's just junk. There shouldn't be this stuff out there, but it is because there is strong apostasy and that stuff will suck people away so fast. You might get scared that some of the things I say might uh, influence your children in a wrong direction and that's not true. The stuff they hear on radio, the stuff they watch on television, that they watch for many hours a day and listen to for many hours a day, you think grace is going to pull them that way? No. <laughs> There's so much apostasy, it doesn't matter. They're going to go that way anyway, unless they have doctrine, unless they get the Word of God in their souls. That's the only way that uh, any of us grow up. We would all be pulled in that direction without doctrine. And uh, what I say, if they're listening, then it's good for them. Don't blame me if your children go buck wild. It's apostasy. It has nothing to do with the teaching of grace. How in the world does teaching the Bible hurt anyone? The fact that they can rebound is a wonderful thing because we all need it. And we don't need to get self-righteous during these times and we don't need to start passing blame. What we need to do is simply grow up ourselves. Grow in grace and in knowledge. And uh, you should be more concerned about uh, the other influences out there than mine. My influence is wonderful, awesome. You'll never get it anywhere else. If you don't understand that, you're in the wrong place. Bible doctrine is the greatest influence on anybody. And while we all go astray, at least you know that if you've raised your children right, they'll come back. They'll come back to it, as Solomon said. Solomon himself, who had David, a man after God's own heart, as his father... Solomon had every privilege and opportunity to go with the Word of God, but he didn't, not as a young man. He did as an old man, though. So just because your children might go wild now, have a little bit of grace orientation and understand as long as they love doctrine, that's all that matters. And if they go away from it, they, they'll come back later. It's a promise from the Proverbs. 
to promise. They will if you've raised them right. If they've learned doctrine, I guess for the most part, I guess there's always an exception, but they'll come back to the Word. Because once times gets hard, you see, you start out in life with a lot of fun. You get the, For the first time ever, you get some freedom. Maybe you go to college. I remember I went to college. First time ever, I could stay up till 4 o'clock and not call home. Freedom. I wouldn't do anything crazy. I was just staying up and practicing my violin, whatever, and just say, I'm free. I don't have to call anybody. I don't even have to worry about it. And I can go back to my dorm and go to sleep at 5 o'clock and wake up when the, the next class starts. You're always under authority, but you are given a lot of freedom when you leave the home. And the only way you're ever going to handle freedom is to have doctrine. Otherwise, you'll go buck wild like everybody else that was around me. They went nuts partying all night long, people dropping out of college left and right, partying, just partying too much, getting drunk, doing pot, etc. A big mess. But they didn't have any doctrinal background. And some of them, and by the way, I went to the University of Alabama and all those people there were pretty much Baptist. So we had a lot of uh, Baptist children running around getting drunk and doing pot. My children wouldn't do that. They have an old sin nature. We all do. And they're going to be tempted in every way, shape, and form. So instead of being self-righteous about it, just stick with doctrine. You're going to fail, but stick with doctrine. Stick with the Word, and you'll make it. It has nothing to do with the fact that I teach grace that somebody might go off the wagon or something else as you see it has nothing to do with it. In fact, legalism will push people away faster than any type of grace teaching. Why is it that all these Baptist uh, young people that were at the University of Alabama were going crazy? First freedom they ever tasted and they had no Bible doctrine behind them. They had no knowledge of the Word. So they said, well, I've, been, I've, le I've lived a sheltered life. Now it's time to raise some hell. And boy, did they ever. Anyway, this is part of what's happening to our country. Apostasy. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. The apostasy is a great pull. And it's pulling people away by the millions. Pulling people, Christians away by the millions. And they're going the way Satan wants them to go. Going right into his cosmic system. As a result, this nation has cancer. You can be the chemotherapy if you get with the Word of God. And that's what we need as a nation. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to the importance of the Word of God so that we can stand in the gap for our own country during these times of virulent apostasy. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.